Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the NZX Beef and Lamb New Zealand uh, chat about regenerative farming and what that might mean from a global perspective for New Zealand. Um, I mean, the, the purpose of today is to have a discussion, not to polarise, not to um, end with a it's good or it's a bad, not to judge, just to talk through with some fantastic experts. I've got Mike Lee beaming in um, in the middle of his evening from New York, and we've got Nicola beaming in from Dunedin. Um, and we've also got Hugh Good from Beef and Lamb New Zealand, uh, who's going to come on later because we've had some beef and lamb specific questions asked, and we want to beef and lamb the opportunity to answer them rather than us talking on their behalf. Um, I'm Julia Jones, Head of Analytics. My interest, or NZX's interest in this topic, is that we, uh, you know, we look at ESG, which is Environment Social Governance, which is looking across, you know, how do we make money in a way that is good for our planet, good for our people, um, and you know, have economic sustainability, environment, and social. So, look, I'm going to kick off with Mike. Just first asking you to explain what your background is and what your connection to regenerative farming is. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a really great pleasure to speak to you all uh, uh, so far away from me. Uh, greetings from New York. Uh, things are great here. <laughs> but um, so uh, my name is Mike Lee. I am uh, the co-founder, co-CEO of a food innovation firm uh, named Alpha Food Labs. Um, now, we are, our, our mission is to help uh, food companies think about the future of food, and we help them with innovation strategy and product development, all in the interest of advancing the conversation around uh, better results for people and planet. Uh, we're an extremely mission-driven company, so we're not really interested in kind of working on any old junk food or anything like that. We're all trying to make uh, the food system a little bit better uh, and, and, and start to uh, create food, feed the world, have accessible food for everyone, but still kind of have good outcomes for the planet. So um, that's really where I come from. Um, I spent my entire career working inside food, inside tech. I've seen a lot of, of kind of different uh, instances, but I think the one common thread that I've seen is that I've always been a systems thinker. Um, I've been th working with kind of larger organizations and, and starting to help them see all the chess pieces together and try to connect the dots to say, how do we all work together to kind of advance ourselves to, to have a better goal? Obviously, food uh, is the ultimate system. Um, and so that's kind of where I come at this is, you know, we spend a lot of time with consumers, we spend a lot of time with retailers, we spend a lot of time on the marketing end, but we also spend an equal amount of time talking to farmers, talking to distributors, processors, and everything in between. And I think our kind of sweet spot is to be able to see all of the pieces on the on the board and, and, and start to make linkages so that everyone is collaborating better and speaking the same language instead of sort of um, having friction and working against each other. Um, I am not a farmer, um, but you know, I, I think the difference is I know that I'm not a farmer and I'm not here to tell anyone how to farm. Um, but I, I do can speak for uh, what consumers are looking for. And I think my job here is to help translate what I see with consumers um, and translate that to what it might mean for all of you out there uh, in New Zealand. So thanks for having me. Awesome, welcome, welcome. And Nicola, talk us through you know, your background, but also what are you seeing from, I guess if we think of Mike being the outside in view of New Zealand, um, you're the inside out view to the globe. Mm, mm, sure, thanks Julia and, and uh, hi to everybody out there this morning, thanks for having me. Um, Julia, uh, as, um, as, you, as you mentioned, I'm Nicola Johnston, I'm Head of Marketing here at Silver Fern Farms and uh, it's my great privilege to be leading our efforts to grow the Silver Fern Farms brand into a, a globally recognised New Zealand brand. Um, myself, I've spent the lion's share of my career uh, in, in senior roles in the FMCG uh, sectors and in business to business marketing roles across various different sectors from health and wellness and beauty to food and fibre. Uh, and uh, in most of those roles, I've been really lucky uh, to be involved in positioning some really iconic New Zealand brands like Mainland Cheese, like Fonterra Brands, to successfully meet customer and consumer needs. So much of my role here at Silver Fern Farms is, is, is really focused on identifying global market trends and harnessing, harnessing consumer insights, and then really designing marketing strategies that, allow, uh, that enable our brand to leverage those opportunities. The ultimate goal, obviously, is that we generate incremental returns for our shareholders by, by building uh, brand equity. So as part of our plate to pasta strategy here at Silver Fern Farms, we really invest pretty heavily in market research and consumer insight. Uh, um, like Mike, uh, we're working with global partners uh, like Cantati and S around the world and, and, and people like Mike. 
Over the last eight years, we've seen the rise of grass-fed as a key differentiating attribute in the red meat space, and now we're really looking for the next galvanising insight. So just, just by way of example, there are now upwards of, of, of 70 different grass-fed brands uh, in the US beef chilled market alone, and so we're constantly on the lookout for the next thing that's going to help us create a defendable point of difference in an enduring brand position. So uh, in terms of where uh, I come in on the, on the regenerative agriculture, we've uh, been watching this very closely over the past year or so, um, sitting alongside beef and lamb in, on this space. We've noticed a huge shift around carbon and climate change in particular. That won't come as a surprise to anybody. COVID uh, setting aside that, that agenda momentarily while we deal with the impacts, but call it the Greta Thunberg effect or the Attenborough effect, people are just becoming more considerate about the impact of their choices on the planet and that's really extending to food, certainly in our premium target market of conscious consumers. So we've, we've been monitoring uh, the development of that trend for some time. We're watching it gather momentum. Uh, in that time, it's really started to exhibit many of the hallmarks of what we'd consider an enduring trend, and it's, it's pretty rapidly accelerating out there. So we see it um, you know, picked up by early adopters at the grassroots level and producers, and then there've been some key early stage academic publications it's been picked up by some special interest groups and NGOs, even Greenpeace. We've even seen it enter into the political space in the US via agendas like the New Green Deal. And, and, and now we're starting to see really large multinational brands like Danon, General Mills and Nestle get on board. And when that happens, uh, it's pretty safe to say that it's something that it's going, is, is going to be here to stay. And, and so we've been actively working on what that means for us. What kind of opportunity or platform might that provide our brand, Silverfin Farms, our company, but also New Zealand as a whole um, is one of the world's foremost producers of, of quality food and fibre. Awesome, awesome. Now, I just want to remind those who are listening that you can ask questions through this. Um, look, I, what I would want like to say is um, we actually have had lots of questions come through prior. So if we can't get to your question, we are going to take them forward and I will come back to you with a response. So um, if we don't actually get, if we can't get them all answered. Um, now, look, I remember ages ago someone told me a great gave me a great quote and I'll probably mess it up, but I think it was, you know, people have never cared so much or known so little about how their food is produced. So so Mike, for you, from all your work, what do consumers actually think about Regen? Do they even know the name? And is this something that's likely to be forced upon um, the producer? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um the region ag movement, if you want to call it for a moment, is, is 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 different. It's very different than sort of the other kind of sustainability and food movements we've seen before. Um, if you look at something like, you know, organic, where you know organic started out where there was this, this early adopter phase and it kind of matured a little bit, and then all these other brands were kind of running around trying to play catch up to be organic because there was already a consumer out there that was saying, I want organic stuff. So everyone's trying to make organic stuff. That's a very different beast than what's happening right now with Regen Ag. Because I would I would argue that the, the average consumer doesn't really even know the term, to be honest with you. They're, they've just kind of come on board with organic. They're still catching up to that. However, um, they do want clean water. They do want clean air. They do want healthy soils. They do want nutritious food. They do want clean food. So if you put aside the term regenerative ag for a moment, and I know that's a loaded term that I think is, is sparked a lot of emotions on both sides, if you kind of forget about the term for a minute and all sort of ask yourself, do we all believe that we should have leave the soil better than when we started? Should we leave the water better than when we started? Should we make wholesome, accessible food and have communities that are strong, diverse, resilient, uh, have farmers that have good, strong livelihoods? These are all the tenets of regenerative act, right? Um, so it, it's, 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 and I think we get tripped up a lot because regenerative ag, even though paradoxically all of the techniques that are, are kind of within it have been done for thousands of years by indigenous people, it's nothing new, but the term itself is sort of new, which is a little bit odd because it's sort of putting a new name on something that's very old. Um, but at the heart of it for me, I think it's, it's, do you care about the planet and do you care about feeding in a way that leaves everything better off for our children than, than we had it? Um, and if the answer to that is yes, then you probably subscribe to some form of regenerative act. Now we can all talk about the tactics of how to execute that. And that's sort of the um, complexity about regenerative ag is like, whereas organic was, if you do these four things, um, you know, and, and you check those boxes, you are certified organic and that's done. And it's one size fits all. 
And Regen Ag at, at its spirit, I think, is not that simple. And that's, I think, why we get so tripped up on the terminology is because, you know, if there's 500 farmers on this call right now, if you're regenerating your soil and your land, there's going to be 500 different ways to do that, right? And so part of the challenge that we have for consumers is how do you honor the true complexity and nuance of what it actually means to regenerate land and create food while still making it sort of digestible conceptually for the average consumer, which we all know has about two seconds to process any sort of information. It's a really tall order, um, but I, I would say that unlike organic, where I think a lot of people had to play catch up, we are at the forefront of it right now where we get to actually help shape it before consumers kind of run with it. This is sort of a luxury. This is, this is very much akin to Steve Jobs, the night before he introduces the iPhone, no one ever asked him for an iPhone. They didn't know what it was. They asked for email, internet, and you know a map on a phone and a telephone. They asked for the elements of that, and then he said, I call this the iPhone. That's the exact same thing that I think is the opportunity we have for regenerative ag. People aren't asking for regenerative ag by name. They're asking for clean water, soil, clean food, healthy yeah. communities. Uh, and for better or for worse, the name that's been attached to it right now is regenerative ag. The second part of your question, is this something that's likely to be forced upon the producer or is the producer in the driver's seat? That's up to you. Um, it, it will only be forced upon you if you let it be forced upon you. And, and that's where I think, again, this is not a trend that's already mature in the market where we have to play catch up and be reactive. Um, this is our chance to be on offense and be proactive about it. So if you're worried about regen ag, if you're worried that it's going to be a whole new set of requirements that's going to be foisted upon you and change your whole farming operation, you 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 don't have to worry about that as much because you can do something about it and, and be a part of defining it. And one of the biggest parts about I think the spirit of regen ag, the movement, is that this needs to be a producer-led movement. Um, and, and really, I think that's how it should be. Um, and I tell myself, you know, all the time in boardrooms with, you know, FMCG companies that, you know, the past 50 years, these brands have dictated what farmers need to do. And that created a certain culture. Regen Ag is sort of a pivot opportunity where the growers and the farmers can dictate to the brands what this means. So it, it, it all just comes down to that mind shift of like, let, let's go on offense, not defense. And kind of take own narrative like if we are proactive and we um run with it first then then we hold that opportunity to to create the narrative that that works for us um just hearing you speak and it, it was you know i'd love to hear this from both of you from my perspective i think sometimes new zealand although we're very good at exporting volume we haven't been you know we do tend to leave value on the table um, you know, is this an opportunity for us to capture the existing value? You know, when I'm hearing you talk about clean water <clears throat> and clean food and healthy soils and, you know, the tech, there are multiple tactics to get to that. You know, is it that we just need to capture the value rather than do heaps more right now? Nicola, did you want to start with that one? Yeah, look, I think I think we're already starting to tap the value in in our global markets, but I think it's a question. Um, I, I, back to your point, probably um, Julia, about we tend to come at this from really opposite poles, and I think I think where we we need to change our thinking is is, is to start actually. Um, talking about it from a point of consensus um, and, and, and from a point of view of really understanding also what um, those concerns are that, that consumers have to, um, to Mike's points. I mean, I would certainly echo that uh, consumers, they might not have a deep sense of what regenerative really is right now, but they're starting to see it be positioned as answering their key concerns around emissions and soil health, biodiversity, water quality, certainly through COVID, the, the sustainability and the resilience of their food supply chain um, and the intent Density of their farming systems, and and so somebody on the on the feed actually said um, that, that, and I think thanks Brendan if you're out there looking forward to exploring the continuum because at the extreme of those poles aren't really where that lasting progress gets made, 
Um, and so back to your point, I think what we can agree is New Zealand's got you know one of the most unique pastoral farming systems in the world. Off the back of that, we produce a, what we believe is a superior product, certainly is in terms of it's grass fed, it's nutritious, it's you know we respect animal welfare. I think we could all agree that we could do a better job of telling that story on the world stage and proving just how special that product is. And, and I certainly haven't met a farmer who wouldn't say that that we deserve to be recognised and rewarded for what, what we already do on farm and through the supply chain for the care that we take for the great product that we produce. And certainly what I see around the country is that a significant proportion of our pastoral farmers are already really committed to farming more sustainably, leaving their farm better than they found it. They're already looking after soil, they're integrating livestock, they're grazing rotationally, you know, they're improving biodiversity, they're riparian planting, and, and, and they are looking to reduce inputs where it makes sense. Um, but you'd also be hard pushed to find a farmer that doesn't think they can't do better. And I think that's what regenerative farming is, is really all about. It's about that journey of continuous improvement. Um, we do have an opportunity to, to define it in our image, I believe. I think that's an exciting opportunity for New Zealand um, and certainly uh, one that we're interested in exploring. Mike, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think, you know, I've worked with beef and lamb for a few years now on various kind of initiatives and things like that. And, and one of the big focuses I've always kind of really tried to drive home is is amplifying the storytelling of, of how you guys convey what's happening over there. Um, you know, I, I think you know it's easy to take for granted what you have if you're there every single day for it. It's not until you kind of leave it and you see that there's another world where people don't farm the way you do, um, that you, you kind of realize how incredibly special it is. So I've always sort of said, you know, um, New Zealand has an opportunity all the time to be one of the kind of, you know, legendary kind of meats and, and have all of that great kind of mentality associated with your product the same way that, you know, Kobe beef is associated with Japan, Ibero Coham was associated with Spain, you know, Bordeaux was associated with French wine. Now those are all kind of luxury goods, right? And certainly you can play in that game too, but like how do you kind of build a similar name recognition where that you say New Zealand beef and lamb or wine or whatever, um, and then instantly anyone worldwide conjures up that image of not just the flavor and the sensory aspect, but the philosophy and the, and the stewardship that's behind it, right? Um, so, you know, th that opportunity is always there. And I think that, that in, in my opinion, humbly, I present that that could be always just a guiding light for you all as to how do you get closer to that, right? How do you get closer to that? And so, um, and, and, and with that is, is, is the, the, if you can successfully do that, that's capturing that additional value, you know? Yeah, it's um, and that's always kind of, I guess, part of the um, I think polarization sometimes, isn't it, around um, our story and how we do it, and and it's very New Zealand specific. But that leads me on to a couple of now we had two different questions, but I'll wrap them into one just around the economics of this. So um, you know, is regenerative agriculture economic? Um, you know, they they sort of quote a story from Australia that showed that it wasn't as economic. Um, and then there was uh, um, you know, another one saying what are the economics of regenerative and I get that right because um, it's great to do beautiful things for the planet but things cost money and we need to make sure that we're economically sustainable um, as well so what are your thoughts both of you on the economics behind it just an easy well, question I bring it back I bring it but I bring it back to the analogy of the night before the iPhone was, le was released what's the economics of the iPhone you don't know we know now we know it was a smash hit but the day before that thing launches, you have no idea. You just know you had to sink a bunch of money into making the thing. Now, um, th this this it, this is huge. And, and we saw this in organic, right? We saw the biggest part in organic is that transitional phase. The three years you have to be uh, kind of somewhere in between organic and conventional where you're not able to get the premium that organic demands on the market, but you're paying the extra cost to farm organically, right? That's that's always the hard part to get through. And, and organic still struggles with that. Regenerative is, is, is more so as well. Um, I think part of what we're sort of looking at with regenerative is that I don't think this movement, if you want to call it that, is going to advance by one single link in the chain advancing. Everything has to innovate. So if you care about getting or uh, regenerative ag advancing, you should care just as much about what happens on the farm as what happens in the banks with financing, right? Because right now the whole system is set up not really 
in rhythm with what Regenerative wants to do. The returns that a bank might expect from their loans is not in sync with how Regenerative goes. So you got to ask yourself, how do you create some sort of financial vehicles that can give the support to farmers who want to convert to regenerative and, and help them sort of weather that transition period where admittedly, yes, you're not going to um, clear the, 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 you know, the, the profit line just yet because you have to invest in it. Not to mention that, you know, it, there's still some cultivation in the market we have to do um, to, to command those premiums. So um, it, it's, it's, it's like anything. I, I think it, it definitely is something we need to address. We need to look at it with all parts of the supply chain. Um, but I think I would argue it's a worthwhile endeavor because we have a moral imperative to try to use agriculture as a tool to solve climate change and things like that, not be a tool to uh, just sustain it or damage it. Yeah. Nicola, your thoughts? Yeah, and look, I'm I'm a marketer, and, and so I can really only speak credibly with a market lens on this. Um, I think the work that we're doing to explore this is really important to validate whether uh, there's an opportunity <coughs> there to, to you know, to generate premiums in the market. Um, I certainly support Mike's view in terms of it makes good business sense, particularly not just financial sense, but social sense. And, um, you know, it, the, the reasons that we go into business now, are, our motivations shouldn't necessarily just be financial, although obviously that's an incredibly important part um, of, of the equation. Um, we, it's all from farms, obviously, we've been, uh, uh, we've, we've kind of proven that we're able to identify these specific market opportunities based on consumer needs and then develop specific livestock programs that meet uh, that meet those. Um, it's equally important that we're able to verify the attributes that underpin our claims. So um, off the back of those programs, we are uh, rewarding our farmers for doing more. Um, but we do need um, that sort of underpinning level of assurance because market Market claims need that robust external validation. I think um, I think there there's a broader opportunity for New Zealand here, but in terms of the commercial opportunity that um, that's really um, we're just starting to uncover now uh, whether that's going to be of interest to our customers. And we're certainly getting some positive feedback from a majority of our customers that we've recently sampled um, around that. Awesome. I think too, you know, you kind of wonder, I think we need to remember that there'll always be a customer. Um, it just is about that level that makes it economically sustainable for our businesses to survive. And then, to you know, I customers. look at it from mm. an external customer or consumer, the person that buys the product, and then you've got your neighbour <laughs> and the person that allows you to continue to produce that product. And you've kind of got this, um, one gives you right to entry into market, and then the other one is going to give you the right to actually produce. And I, I think um, they can be a little different at times, but I guess we need to take note of all of them. Um, there's one question too in regards to, you know, what might government do to encourage, um, I guess, more progression in this space? And, um, and, and, you know, how might we use exemplars to kind of shift some of the thinking in this space? Any thoughts on that? Mike. Government plays, yeah, government plays a huge role. I mean, we're currently embarked on a, on a large research study, a global research study around regenerative ag. And one of the trends that's coming up is the importance of policy to accelerating this. Because what happens is, you know, in some countries, you've got a farm subsidy system that basically locks you into a monoculture model. Um, you know, uh, uh, you got farm subsidies that sometimes only reward you for the number of acres you have and not for the outcomes you have. Now, there's some conversations about how to change that. But you know, if, if the goal of regenerative or whatever you want to call it is to, you know, kind of build carbon in the soil and build biodiversity and things like that, yet the subsidy model doesn't reward any of that. Why would anyone do that? Right. And that's sort of the that's sort of the problem. Um, and I, so I, I think that, again, to, to our kind of my original point about like every link in the supply chain has to work together to try to get this um, policy has to step up, too. And policy has to make sure uh, that this is on their radar and, 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 and make this a part of kind of, you know, government's, you know, climate strategies to say, how do we incentivize and make it easier for farmers to do the right thing by the planet and not get stuck into some sort of subsidy system that just rewards something that is not connected to any of those outcomes whatsoever. So I definitely think policy, just like the financing, those are two really key parts that need reinvention. Um, it's almost like re you need regenerative policy and regenerative finance yeah. as much as you do regenerative farming. 
making making sure legislation or regulation doesn't lock us into the status quo, um, Absolutely. which I think um, we're very lucky. We don't have subsidies in New Zealand. Uh, I think that's an advantage for us because we can yes. be a bit more control and adaptable. However, there, there are a level, um, well, I believe, and my uh, amateur view is that um, you know some of our legislation, some of our regulation locks us into the status quo, so it makes it harder to progress than it does to to um, you know it's much easier to stay the same. So Nicola, any thoughts from you around what government might do, or is there any work that you're doing in particular with government around this? Mm. Look, I'd, I'd, I'd echo the sentiments of Mike in terms of the role. I think that some of the policy settings in New Zealand um, under the, the, the current and new, uh, newly elected government are certainly pushing the sector further down the path to make sure we retain our social licence to farm, improve the quality of life of our communities and, our, and, and all New Zealanders and, and, and ultimately protect our reputation and, and commercial advantage on the global stage. So I think, I think actually uh, where we're heading um, is is very is, is really unique and something that we can we can leverage. Um, I certainly don't think um, that in the US, uh, in particular, for example, uh, they're light years away from being able to make any sort of systemic change to face into this trend in any meaningful way. And um, the policy settings, um, uh, you know, are not there in the complexity of 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 them actually doing a a compelling job uh, in that space. It, it, it's it, the conditions just aren't there for that to probably come for, to fruition. So we've kind of got a moment in time and a window where we can leverage what we're doing. And particularly, I'd like to see government, um, you know, really um, bringing to be a funding in this space um, through organisations participating, through science, through, you know, through our universities to really make sure that we're bringing the research and the science along with this as we explore it. We understand we're not, we're not expecting um, farmers to you know to leave aside all of the great um, pasture management and um, you know all of the practices that that we're so good at here in New Zealand what we're what we're wanting is science to come along and support actually what we do uh, and take a systems approach which is a more complex approach to balancing up all of the the choices that we make on farm and we're already doing a fantastic job at that yeah, you know, I mean, one, one more thing oh sorry, sorry Mike more... you go yeah, one more thing to add to that, you know, as the resident American looking inside from the outside, um, like Nicholas said, the, the the policy government landscape here could not be any more complicated and just quite frankly insane right now. But we sort of, there's a certain kind of, we, we sort of kind of look at uh, in admiration of kind of what you guys have been able to do in, in certain other parts of government so quick and agile that the United States just can't really do. So. I've always sort of thought that, you know, I think New Zealand has, again, an opportunity to jump ahead in terms of saying like, okay, well, is the US just gonna argue about our subsidies for the next 35 years and get nothing done? Well, New Zealand can just go straight to the solution and then you can be the example that we follow. You know, and, and I think that that comes back to that original thing is like, I do not think Regen Ag should ever be viewed as something forced upon you. It's something that you guys can capture. And actually, you are at a distinct advantage, especially with things like policy, to skip ahead of some of, you know, the countries like the US and, and Europe, because you maybe don't have as much of this political quagmire that we have. And so I think that's an opportunity that's up for the grabs. Yeah, I mean, look, to put it, I guess, put it in numbers perspective, and might, you might have a few different numbers than I, but, um, you know, I think the global consumption is is estimated at 315 million tonne of red meat, and we export just over a million tonne. So, you know, we, we really have an <coughs> awesome ability to be agile and shift and move. Um, and, and we could have some niche markets in this, and you know, within the space. I think um, sometimes we get hung up, you know, I don't know who coined the phrase years ago that we were feeding the world. Whoever coined it needs to shut up because it's a dumb phrase because we'll never feed the world. We were never set up to feed mm. the world. We're actually very small in the food system. An eight trillion US dollar food system, we're less than 2%, but we're really important um, in that well-being area where we can really take advantage uh, uh, of that. Uh, you, you may only be able to export one million pounds of meat, but the thought leadership you can export is infinite. That's infinitely scalable. Right. And that's the big area where you believe we can probably lead where the opportunity is. Now, I'm going to assume to the questions because they are growing. Um, so, look, one person has asked, um, will this, will regenerative ag mean that we can no longer, we no longer need chemical fertilizers? I know none of us are scientists, so we may not be, uh, 
comfortable answering that. But as far as what you're hearing from consumers, is the chemical fertilizer part of that? I don't think it'll get to zero, right? I mean, even if you turn the entire world regenerative, I don't think it'll get to zero. I think, you know, and, and again, I'm not an agro, you know, biologist. So I, but what I understand from farmers I've talked to is that, you know, there, there's a world where you can kind of more sparingly use some of these things more selectively, more precisely, you know, in a way that um, isn't just kind of a blind blanketing of your farmland with certain chemicals and things like that. Um, again, uh, you know, I, ultimately, I actually think regenerative is actually very empowering for the farmer because instead of giving a one size fits all framework for every farmer to follow, it actually empowers the farmer to say, you know your land better than any of us do, as long as you're on board with the good faith kind of goal of kind of making the planet better, um, the, the control is up to you, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so I, I think that's, yeah, it, it, and that, that's, that, that's where it's complicated, but it's actually empowering is because there is no one size fits all. And that's sort of the beauty of it. Um, so, you know, I put the question back on you. If, if you think that a certain sparing amount of mindful chemicals needs to happen and it's not going to have long-term adverse effects, that's up for you to decide and prove, you know, not me. Awesome, I love that. Um, I think where we got to in some of our farming areas in New Zealand, we've got very prescriptive. Um, and I think we're all different humans and we make decisions differently. And I, I would love, you know, my greatest wish for New Zealand ag is that um, we stop expecting everyone to do things the same and, and we empower difference and we empower that, you know, some people's philosophies will be different in their values and that doesn't make my values different or wrong because they're different to Nicola's. It just means that we might have the same topography and the same soil and live next door to each other, but we might just do things a little bit differently because we make decisions in a different way and we have different levers in our families or in our business mm. that drive us. Mm. Yeah. And so I love that concept of empowerment. Um, what's the ideal pathway to building a differentiated supply chain for New Zealand regenerative products? Nicola, this would be a good one for you. Sorry, can you just repeat that, Julia? What is the ideal pathway to building a differentiated supply chain for New Zealand regenerative products? So, you know, they're sort of getting at, if, if, if Silver Fern Farm said they were going to do, um, I guess, one product skew that was regenerative only, you know, do we have the supply chains to cope with that? Mm. Yeah, look, I mean, we are dealing with a fresh product and that's always the, the with the shelf life and that's always the complexity. Um, we lean very heavily on our partners uh, in our global markets to reach uh, downstream customers, um, distributors and consumers. Uh, it's uh, If there's anything I'd say, I mean, for all parts of regenerative to really, um, to deliver the value that we want to create in that market, all of the things that we need um, is really around uh, digital connectedness and we'd encourage our farmer to, farmers to embrace digital tools so that we're able to connect up that supply chain and show the traceability of that product. We'd encourage all our farmers to make sure that the New Zealand Farmer Short is a minimum. Um, we'd encourage our farmers to look out for New Zealand Farmer Short Plus uh, when when that new standard, which is already being piloted with farmers, um, you know, may come out there. All of those things are, are really critical to building the robust, connected supply chains that we need with tra product traceability uh, to carry those claims confidently to market. Uh, and then we need to work with our farmers to be able to support them through, um, you know, what are the frameworks that we need uh, to be able to, to um, robustly defend those claims in those markets or certainly have them accepted. The other point that I did want to make today as well, we, spend, we seem to spend a lot of time focusing on the US when we talk uh, regenerative agri agriculture. And I, I, I really want to stress that we're not seeing that as just a, an opportunity in the US. Um, it's certainly a very big market for us and some of those consumer drivers are certainly certainly to the fore. Um, but they are expressed right across our markets, whether it be from the UK uh, into Germany and Europe, um, and uh, even in, uh, in the parts of the Middle East and in China with, uh, you know, they're a long way from being driven by the same environmental considerations and drivers as, as perhaps consumers in the Western market, but they're certainly starting to talk about climate change in a meaningful way in terms of the targets that they might be chasing down. So, I mean, could this be relevant for China in the future? Absolutely. Um, so that's that's important. You just answered my next question, which was, is it only the US picking <laughs> Mike, from your perspective, have you got anything to add to that? Because I imagine, you know, you are in the US, but you're looking at the whole world. Uh, in terms of supply chains? 
Well, even supply chains and even is it only the US? I think there's kind of a perception that the US is the oh. only kind of region. Oh, no, kind no. Of oh, I agree. I agree with Nicola. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of those countries you mentioned, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. It's not just a uniquely US thing. You know, the US might be maybe a little bit louder on it because there's just been a lot of thought put into this historically, but um, it's not just the US that's a big market for this. Do you know of any countries, Mike, that are kind of actually or economies where the government is um, helping producers or supporting farmers, I guess, in a financial term with policy and regulation? Is there anyone doing it really well? Um, well, so what I alluded to before about the subsidies, I was speaking, you know, kind of at the EU level. Um, the EU level currently, there's a lot of subsidies that just reward you based off of how much land you have. And that's created a culture where um, you're incentivized just to accumulate scale. Um, and, and not really accumulate positive ecological outcomes. Um, so there's a lot of kind of legislation and work being in the works right now um, to try to shift that, to try to, um, you know, I think they've listed out a whole huge litany of um, different ecological measures that they can potentially have the, the, the subsidy system start to reward instead of just blindly rewarding acreage. Um, so that's in progress right now. Um, I wouldn't say anyone's doing it well because they're not doing it yet, but you know that's sort of the conversation that I'm seeing. So it's reassuring to see that um, over in the EU, that's the conversation that's happening right now. Right. It just sounds to me like there's, around the world, we're all um, in limbo or mid, mid movement of the movement. Um, there's no, no one's kind of cracked the nut. Mm. And I wouldn't even say mid movement, I'd say early <clears> stage. <throat> I mean, I think, um, you know, we're really seeing uh, that evolve what I'd call a phase one of a trend, um, you know, possibly on the precipice of phase two. So the, the timing is really good to be having these discussions. And certainly a lot of the buzz that we're seeing in our social listening research, et cetera, is actually happening here in our backyard um, and, in, and across Australia and Oceania, Oceania, which I think is a really positive thing as we both explore, you know, how do we wield um, our natural advantage on the world stage. Yeah. Right. And I want to stress, though, even though we're calling this movement new, by no means is the the tech gets mm. behind it new at all. And I think that gets lost in the conversation a lot. Um, indigenous peoples of all countries have been doing this for centuries. Um, and, and so it really, we have an opportunity to make sure that as we kind of grow this into a more, let's call it mainstream kind of trending topic, um, that that is a part of the conversation and it just doesn't become another whitewash thing because I think we'd be really remiss to, to lose out on that opportunity. Um, we need to learn from the mistakes of past sustainability movements and do a better job with this forward. And again, that's why in terms of the conversation being early, it's exciting because we can still shape it and we don't have to accept anything as true mm. that we don't like. Mm. Yeah, I think as 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 well. Some of the um, I'd, I'd just encourage um, the audience to think about regenerative as a as a spectrum of practice. And if you start, you know, with very industrialized mass produced system farming, agricultural systems, monoculture cropping, all of that, with on on the one hand, um, on the left hand, and you know the extreme regenerative practice potentially on the other hand. I think what we're really saying is, you know, any any movement, there's always going to be people that are on the fringe and they're important because they show, they take the high ground, um, you know, they're very principled, they're very purist in their approach um, and, and they carve a bit of a path. What we're saying actually is come back a bit from that. There's, a, there's a, probably a lot here that we're already doing that we can start to shape and define um, and, and start to tell to tell that story. So we don't need to get too hung up on are we regenerative or are we not regenerative? We're saying we're on this on this spectrum and there's room for continuous improvement. And and the way that we might tell a regenerative story as New Zealand will not be, you know, back to the future. We've always been modern, progressive, innovative. Uh, we will use the tools in our toolkit to um, you know, we can we can explore those tools and and look at moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, and it's quite interesting. Like a lot of the questions coming through are very um People are, are hanging off this desire for a definition. Um, they want mm. those four four key things that you can tell them that regenerative is, and and it feels a little bit, um, I guess, like I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Mike, how do we move through people wanting a definition and wanting it? Because as you've said before, as a consumer, you don't even know the word. Consumers don't even know the word, but there's this list of things, attributes that they want to see of how their food is produced. You know, how do we get beyond the desire for this hard and fast definition or do we need one? 
don't wait for a definition make it up oh that's <laughs> it that's it if you don't it, if you if you wait around for a definition you're either not going to get one or you're going to get one you don't like so now's your chance yeah. to define yeah. it the way you think it is and build a movement look i mean one of the beauty of being a digitally connected world today is that um voices are sort of have an equal playing field that has pros and cons um but certainly it's not like you have to sit back and, and clear your message through 42 bodies of authorization to get it started start learning from you know people that have created movements from their twitter accounts and their instagram accounts and if you think regenerative is a certain definition and, and don't even again don't even think about the term regenerative agriculture so much think about how do you what is your mental framework for how you leave the earth better off than it was when you got here and how do you do that that's your definition of regenerative and if you can get other people to agree with you and support you on that then you've got a definition cool we've actually got a really cool question here um just saying you know look it's hard for policymakers to make rules um and guides based off something fluid and principle based like regen but you know is there a, and there's another question similar to this as well so could this be the start of a new type of regulation um regulation enabled by blockchain distributed autonomous organizations so really applying technology and traceability um so that we can have difference but we know what's happened first what, what are your thoughts there both of you Mike, we'll start with you again. Sorry, Nick. We'll come back. Good. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I think, you know, part of what's hard about this is that, that thinking about this takes a completely different mindset of how to do it. And and we we do assume today that it's hard for politicians to create legislation that's fluid and, and adapting. Why does it have to be the same? You know, we need to all kind of, you know, grow up and, and figure out how to push through that. Um, and again, you know, look, look, I mean, coming back to like what I personally admire about seeing what you guys have been able to do in government, um, you've crushed COVID twice pretty quickly and we still can't seem to get anyone to wear a mask over here, which is insane to me. Um, it really hit me when you had the disaster shooting at Christchurch, how fast you guys got rid of assault rifles in what, 31 days or something like that. We've been working on that here for my entire life and we've gotten nowhere. So again, this is another example where you guys, I think, have a relative advantage to maybe some other governments where you can move a little bit more like a speedboat and less like an oil tanker. Um, and, and yes, it is hard to craft legislation that um, enables, you know, complexity and fluidness. But, you know, we have laws around taxes. Is there one way to do your taxes? There's a million ways to do your taxes, right? But we still created a tax code that more or less works. So I would look at it that way and say, like, again, I, I have to, draw, I can't stress this enough. Like, this is a blank slate of paper. This is not a thing that's happening to you. It's a thing that you can take and control and make it up as you go along. Mac, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't, obviously, you know, you don't want to be in a position where where regulation and, and policy is 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 dictating your destiny. But I I I think um, that the conditions are right for us here in New Zealand to actually be looking at this as a bit of a springboard for um, Ford. Uh, in in back to your original uh, question, Julia, is is to stop leaving some of that value on the table. Um, I, I, it's very seldom uh, in your life as a marketer that you get, uh, I guess, a movement or something which is sitting in the sweet spot, uh, you know, for for your sector, for your industry, for your country. And I think that's why I'm particularly excited about about what this could um, could do for New Zealand if we if we respond um, appropriately. Oh, I'm just going to throw something out there, guys, which is a bit random. We have just got so many questions that have come in. It's, it's almost a bit scary. And there's also lots of comments, and some I'm not going to read out because they're not very professional. But, um, you know, <laughs> why is this so politicised? Why is this, you know, there's one sort of about government and, you know, they're not going to pay for anything, rah, 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 and then, you know, we go on to criticise the government. But, you know, I love exactly what you said, Mike. It's not a thing that's happening to you. And I think what we've done is we've completely politicised it in New Zealand, we've turned it into something that, you know, someone got up one day and just wanted to do things in a mean way. Um, but the reality of it is, you know, uh, the government, we vote 
for a government and when there's a majority it shows that those people voting have a certain philosophy and a feeling and a way of wanting to um what they expect from us but why is this particular thing why is regen so politicized mike <laughs> answer it give us a big big answer i think it's been political well because i i think farmers don't like being told what to do you know and, and I, i'm not here to tell you what to do i'm not here to tell you to do anything except for find out what you think is right and do that you know and and i think the only question i ask is are you for uh helping the ecological health of our planet or not you know if, if you are then we can have a conversation on how to achieve that and i'm not going to tell you how to do that on your particular plot of land if you're not for that then that's another question that's probably where we'll just disagree um because i think agriculture mm -hmm. should be a tool to regenerate the planet um while it's feeding the planet um but that's why it's politicized and i think honestly like um you know i, I think especially in the states and this is you know very centric a lot of the brands uh have co-opted farming and, and we've everything everything on farming has been decided by anyone who's not a farmer and i think that's a big problem right um, I, I, I personally believe that every farmer on the planet knows exactly what to do if they want to keep their land healthy and their product quality. The question is, is the world around them and the incentives that are structured around them enabling them to do that or not? Because I get it. Like, I get it. Like, it, it's, a, it's probably a hard choice if you're like, okay, well, I want to do these things because I think they're right, but no one's paying for them. So I have to do these things, which I think are less right. That's a hard thing. And I'm not going to tell you you're wrong um you're doing it bad because at the end of the day we're all just trying to feed our families and that's 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 the, you can't fault anyone for that um so i think that's why it's politicized you know um but but again i i keep coming back to this but it doesn't have to be that way um in in, in a sense actually I'm, I'm actually happy that it's sort of polarizing because it means it's getting people's attention um yeah. and and so i i want these voices to come out and i want us to all have a vigorous debate and i i want farmers involved in that they have to be involved in it um and and but no one's going to force farmers to get involved in it you have to do it yourself right because otherwise mm -hmm. the marketers will do it and i'm a marketer too and and so you know that's sort of just my only like personal self-deprecation um i should not be defining to you what regenerative farming is you should be defining to me you tell me what regenerative farming is i'll figure out how to sell it to a consumer and we'll go from there yeah and i mean as you're talking i'm thinking you know it's about your ecosystem it's you know the, the point made about you know the government's not going to pay for us to change regulation which is you know there there are some some there is some investment coming in through mpi for um you know looking at these practices I think though there's a big ecosystem, right? So we've got the banks that have funded it. We've got the services that work around <clears> them. <throat> we've got our people that sell into our farmers. You know, I think it's everybody's role to support them in this ecosystem. I don't think, you know, if for any reason, and please anyone listening, I don't believe this is going to happen, but if for some reason there was regulation implant, um, implemented that impacted short-term maybe land values, then I would expect banks to be part of a solution for as we move forward you know i'd expect banks to be part of you know we everyone forced farmers to change and to volume 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 you must do more you must do more from our government through to our banks through to our everyone around them um through to our industry bodies and you know i absolutely could not speak more highly of beef and lamb new zealand for having the courage to actually look at this and 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 take the hits you know because they get a few punches back but you know, it comes mm. back to our ecosystem. Everyone's got to support this. Everyone's got to help it. Um, can I just you know. can I just add to that, Julia? I yeah. do think it is still really, really important that we focus on the market. And I started off this conversation today by saying uh, that our job, particularly as a processor, uh, like Silverfern Farms, like Mike, is not going to tell Silverfern Farms suppliers uh, what to do. What we're there to do is to identify what those consumers are looking for, what their concerns are, and to respond to that. And if there's a premium in doing in, in doing so, presenting that opportunity back to our farmers um, so that they can make the, the, the changes that they want to make, um, you know, and that they can have a fully informed view of that. Um, and that's, that's certainly, um, you know, part of, part of the equation. 
Yeah, it's um, exactly. And that's the key. Look, I've just had a cool comment come through, you know, and this goes back to Mike's point earlier around Indigenous. It's, you know, Regen is an interest in particular to Māori farming entities, which have always been environmentally conscious. However, it's imperative that it's an economically sustainable system, particular for Ahu Whenua Trusts and Corporations. Um, does the science support economic productivity using current commodity prices? So either of you got any thoughts on that one? You know, is the science uh, and the economics, are they aligning? Uh, look, I think it's really early days in, in both of those fields, to be honest. Um, and as I said, I'd answer it through a, a market lens because I'm not an expert in terms of on-farm economics. Um, the and, and I spoke earlier about the science needing to come along to support farmers and making the decisions about what tools they make for the outcomes that they want to achieve. Um, so, yeah, no, I've just lost my train of thought there, Julia. Repeat the question. I'm um, just around, you know, the alliance, the alliance, the um, alignment of um, science and economics. You know, are those systems actually aligning? No offence to the yeah. scientists. So, I mean, no, it's not that economic focus. <laughs> Yeah, and, and look, I think, our, you know, we'll all have various views on, on our academic institutions, particularly in the agricultural space and um, in, in, in the great work that they do in terms of bringing science along to support our agricultural systems. I just think there needs to be, um, you know, more, more focus in this space, um, more focus on giving uh, farmers uh, the research that they need to make the decisions um, in, in this area. Mike, any sort of yeah, I mean, uh, Well, I mean, I think on a very general level, I don't think the current uh, science of what's good for the planet matches up with the economics. So again, coming back to the United States, like our country is completely based off of monocultures, right? And, and we know that monocultures by and large are not ecologically sort of sustainable. They require a lot of inputs to prop them up, right? And, and so, um, so, so that you could argue is is maybe not the best thing for the ecology, but the marketplace incentivizes it. So that's where I think the mismatch is. And one of the things that we've really spent a lot of time at Alpha Food Labs focusing on is how do we get uh, society at scale to eat in a more sustainable way that mirrors the patterns of nature and doesn't defy it. So, you know, think about biodiversity and biodiverse diets, right? Um, you know, I was having a conversation with somebody about, um, you know, oh, you know, the, the three sisters, uh, the corn, beans, and squash in the United States are Native Americans here have been planting that for centuries. And it's a really symbiotic kind of group of plants that just, you know, keeps soil healthy, keeps pests away. You know, there's a lot of really good benefits to it. And no one plants it besides hobbyist gardeners because there's been no way to kind of harvest it at scale because it's this tangle of kind of vegetation right and and so for me it's sort of like well is it truly because we can't figure out how to harvest it or no one's incentivized someone to figure out how to harvest it right and, and that's where I think that's the biggest problem of like the the economic incentives out there are not necessarily aligned with the things that are better for nature and, and we can all argue about what's better for nature but I think whatever we kind of think is better for nature, we need to kind of close that gap so that we can create marketplaces that sync up with it. So instead of getting our entire country to eat just, you know, uh, cereal grains and sugar, how do we kind of create multi-million dollar brands that eat biodiverse diets? Like, why does it have to be the other way, right? Um, you know, the worst thing I hate hearing from anybody is that's just the way it's been done. That's the worst. Mm. And, oh, yeah. and, and so, I, I kind of envision a world where we can have sort of a, a more harmonious agricultural system that works with nature, but you could still kind of build a brand off of the back of that. It's just, it's selling you diversity instead of monocultures. Yeah, I think the true value, Julia, sorry, the, tr the true sorry. value of, regenerate, of of an RA approach is will really be cracked um, when we get the sweet spot between the intersection of our grass-based farming system um, healthy soils producing really healthy product and if we can verify that the benefit you know the the nutrient density of that the nutritional quality of that and how that then contributes how that ecosystem contributes to healthy people and healthy planet that is when the stars align to to, to really legitimize um, you know RA as part 
cool. I mean, look, there's been a couple of, you know, one really cool question was around, you know, do we actually need a system rethink around economics? And I think we'd all agree happily. I think everyone would agree that we probably do. Um, and then, you know, there's actually several comments in regards to organic versus regen ag. And I, I, I love your view, just quickly, both of you around, um, you know, to me, organic will have always have a space that's always going to have a place. So I don't think regen takes over organic. I think organic is very specific and, um, but you know, do you see space for both or is this the, is this the new organic or how do we look at it? I think there's space for both. And again, it comes down to, we need a much more nuanced, um, you know, organic certification today is sort of just like a sledgehammer when you actually need a scalpel for the, 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 the regulation of it. Um, you know, there's an anecdote that just floored me up in the Pacific Northwest in the United States and Washington state where um, you can use copper sulfate to get rid of fungus um, if and, and stay organic. So organic copper sulfate, a-okay, you can use it. And, and that's fine and good if you're just looking at outcomes in your soil and the plants, but copper sulfate also completely leaches into the water and completely messes up the salmon populations. It throws off their whole navigation system so they don't know where to swim to spawn. So, you know, that is just a great example of how imprecise I think the organic thing is. It depends on which lens you're looking at, right? And that's why we can't just say that is always a bad thing. You know, if you're in a place that has a lot of salmon, maybe you should think twice about using something like copper sulfate. If you're in a place that has no salmon, then by all means, you could probably use it, right? So we got to get to that level where we can parse out the specifics and not just say um, organic is one thing and and, and whatnot, so. Mm. Oh, certainly from, from a Silver Fern Farms point of view, we haven't been able to um, scale organic uh, an organic program successfully. I think that comes down to, um, you know, how prescriptive and restrictive the practices are for our farmers. And I think what RA brings is a broader um, toolbox, if you like. It's not um, prescriptive or reductive in that way in terms of um, saying what you can't do. Um, and, and that will provide more options for farmers. Um, and we see this, you know, we see this as a significant opportunity. It's, um, yeah, and, and look, as I'm hearing you both talk, I just, I guess I would want to stress to any farmers or any producers on the line um, or, or anyone really to stop and listen to, you know, like organics, not good, bad or better, um, regen or non or whatever. Like let's actually accept difference. We are going to produce in different ways, but you know, these core things that consumers are going to want is cleaner water, clean food, healthy soils and making the planet better than it was yesterday and continuing to do so and I think that's probably the key. Um, look, Hugh, I'm going to bring you in quickly. So do you want to jump off mute? Did you, um, there are a few questions that come through. Do you want to just give us a quick outline around beef and lamb's ethos on this and what they're thinking? Yeah, and uh, yeah, thanks for everything. It's been a fantastic session. I realise I've got two minutes left. I mean, I think the, 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 work, the work that we're doing is really about working backwards from consumers. I mean, we could sort of push farmers to change production towards regenerative systems and say, hey, do you want this to the markets? But I think what we're doing is best practice working backwards and seeing what they want, what they desire, how can they help us with the definition of it in terms of what they're prioritizing and what they want, and then you know, changing our systems to fit that. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, we, uh, and and using Mike on this work, I, I want to also acknowledge that MPI have provided funding for this as well and the Brigado Institute um, as part of New Zealand Wine are helping us on this as well. So it's not just our, the red meat sector, but broader than that. And, and I think that sort of chimes with the wider ethos of Regen, that it's not just going to be a, a one type of production in one sector that has to do this, but it'll be across the board um, if we're going to be successful here. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> but, I, but I think, yeah, yeah I, I mean, yeah, I think it's really interesting and great hearing you guys talking about it and um and i've, I've enjoyed listening along even if i haven't been contributing for beef and land look i mean from my perspective I, I get the feeling when i read the questions and i will send them out to the speakers um you know that there has been probably more questions raised than answered which i, I did expect um look please keep the conversation to anyone who's still watching look please keep the conversations continuing um you know as as mike has said We've got to stop thinking that this is a thing that's happening to us and, and really own the situation or own what we want the future to be. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to Nicola and Mike. Mike, I'm sorry that we've cut into your evening. I hope you have, we haven't destroyed no your dinner. It's not, it's not sitting no, it's in the oven going stale or something. 
uh, <laughs> dried up. But um, look, your time, your energy, your 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 um, ethos, and your ability to see across things, both of you, and not have a really um, binary way of looking at it, has been incredibly useful. And um, look, I just hope this conversation continues. It's um, it's a big topic. It's not going away. Progression is here, but as Mike keep reminding us, it's not new. <laughs> It's, um, so let's not think, think we've reinvented the wheel here. We've just uh, refound the wheel and we're just seeing what part of the vehicle we're going to put it on and how we're going to roll with it. So huge thanks to everyone. Thanks for tuning in. And um, we look forward to, I think we're going to have to do this again, guys, because we didn't get enough covered. So we'll, we'll do this again in 2021, I think, early. Anytime. And have a Sounds great, great day. Thanks, Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Julia.